is Stephanie Taylor, and I have been at Google for almost, well, over 10 years now. Um, I've been on the Google Open Source Outreach team that entire time. And it's been a really cool uh, team to be on because I have been able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks. Uh, normally my job involves a lot more travel, uh, obviously not for the last year or probably the rest of this year, but hopefully again in 2022. So I've really been able to meet folks um, you know, in person and get the feedback about the programs, learn about how the program has changed so many people's lives. And it's really cool. That's probably the, my favorite part of my job is to be able to uh, talk to folks and to get feedback on like what we can do to make the program better, but also just kind of they're like, this changed my life. You know, they're like, I now have this job doing this amazing thing over here at this company, or now I'm at Google or at Microsoft or you know or now i'm a mentor so many of our students go on to become mentors themselves which is great so a lot of them also become open source advocates and some even start their own open source projects so um it's been pretty cool so hopefully you can see my slides now can you all see the slide yes we awesome. can good all right then i will move on so um I always want to start the, the presentation with, you know, kind of an overview of what open source itself is because it really is the key to the program. And so, you know, it's, op it's computer software where the source code is distributed under an open source license and there are many different licenses. Um, we, for GSOC, we do require that the license be under uh, an OSI approved license, which is the open source initiative. Um, so there's a big list of approved licenses like Apache and you know, a bunch of various ones, MIT license, et cetera. Um, but that open source license allows anyone to be able to study, to change, improve, and then even distribute that software. And another key part of that open source is really the collaboration, right? It really is about a community, community of dedicated developers working together to make something better, to make the software better. And there's so many different types of projects available to choose from. Um, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about GSOC, but generally for Google Summer Code, or GSOC, um, we have about 200 open source organizations each year that students can choose from. But there are tens of thousands of different projects in the world that are open source projects that you can work on. So, you know, it might take a little uh, Googling or using whatever your favorite search engine might be. Uh, to find some of the other ones, but if you can at least come to Google Summer Code, you can kind of narrow it down to like, okay, here's 200, and then just kind of look through and find something that interests you, because there really is something for everybody. So let's talk specifically about Summer of Code. So Google Summer of Code has been going on for 17 years. It started back in 2005, and it is all online it's always been online so that is not just a change for the last year it's always been entirely online and it's an international program designed to encourage students to participate in open source software development and they have mentors there to help them from the open source community so it really is a mentorship program now these mentors in the open source community are generally not googlers right because most of the projects that we accept into google summer code are external projects like Wikimedia or uh, the Apache Foundation, Linux Foundation. Those are some of the larger ones. Uh, CERN, um, we have some that are astronomy organizations or if you're into robotics or gaming, there's all types of different organizations. There's often Ruby or Python. Um, there's, so, there's so many. I'm just thinking about some of the ones that when I was reviewing the organization applications the last couple of weeks. Uh, tons of different organizations. Now, when I keep bringing up the word community, because that really is what open source is about. It's about working with other people towards a common goal. Now, in open source, a lot of times, a lot of people are volunteers in whatever project they're working on. Not always, often there are full-time positions available at these different organizations, or sometimes people you know, do it as kind of a part-time gig and they have another job, but a lot of this is volunteer. So for the mentors that are helping the students, they're not getting paid to do this. They're doing it because they want to teach new people, teach new students about open source development and about their community. And they want to get the students excited 
about their community. And so hopefully the students will stay involved in their communities after their GSOC program ends. So going a little more into GSOC, um, like I said, you are under the guidance of a mentor and you also earn a stipend for success, successfully completing the project. Now, this year, there are two different um, evaluations. So there's a half one at the halfway point and there's one at the end of the program. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. But when I say successfully completing the project, that doesn't necessarily mean that whatever you and your mentor agreed upon at the very beginning of the program, that you have to complete that. Because sometimes you're working on a project and you might find another, you're like, hey, what if we added this other element? Or what if we did this? And so you kind of might build onto your project, which then, you know, because of the time involved, doesn't allow you to really finish the entire thing that you and your mentor agreed upon, which that's okay. As long as you and your mentor are working together, you might kind of veer your project a different way. Um, and that's totally fine as long as the two of you agree that that is something you want to do. Now, this year we opened it up to students uh, before, for the last 16 years, I guess, it had been for students in accredited university programs. This year we've opened it up because there's so many different ways that students are learning in the world. A lot of folks are doing various types of uh, coding camps and other different types of programs. So we really want to welcome everybody that is a student, a learner essentially, that wants to be a part of GSOC to be able to have that, um, that capability. Uh, the one key thing is you do still have to be 18 years or older. So the way we would describe it is post-secondary students. So that means students that are basically after high school. Um, so whether anytime after high school and you're 18 years old, essentially, at least 18 years old. And there's no, there's no age limit. So we've had students in the past. I think our oldest student was 56 or 58, I think, so far. Um, but uh, we do hope, you know, we're all about getting students from whatever stage in their career. A lot of folks, we're hoping to get a lot of folks this year who may be changing their, you know, changing careers or switching jobs and are interested in learning more about open source and building their skills and getting them involved in GSOC. So now I listed a few of the reasons why you as a student might want to participate. And a lot of this is also based on the feedback that students give us at the end of the program about what they learned from the program and why it was so important to them. So a big part of this is the fact that you're going to be learning new skills and that you're going to gain confidence in your own capabilities. Because a lot of time when you're learning in your whatever academic program you're in, you're not necessarily working on a real project, right? A lot of times it's very theoretical. So, or you're working, you know, with a team or that kind of thing. Here, while you will be working with a community of these open source developers, really it's you focusing on your project. Your mentors, they're helping you. They're answering your questions. They're helping guide you. You know, they want you to succeed. So they're there to help you. But it really is kind of you kind of working on this yourself and really figuring it out and getting the guidance from mentors and other community members. But it's your project. So at the end of the program, you can say, hey, this is the work that I did. Right? It makes it very easy for you to be able to point to a future employer. Um, look, this is something like, well, what kind of work have you done in the past? You're like, here, you can go to this link and check out the project I completed during Google Summer of Code. So then they can see, oh, wow, this person does know how to do all of this. You know, it's a lot of times you're in an interview and especially if you're just coming out of your um, educational program, they're, they're like, okay, you're like, well, we learned this and this and I know all of this. But with GSOC, you can actually prove you know it because you can say, look, I actually did all of this. I built this feature. I wrote this code, etc. And so that's an easy thing to be able to point to. Now, some of the other stuff that you may not necessarily get super involved in during your academic program are the concept of testing and version control. A lot of students tell us that they really didn't do much testing, but testing is so important to any successful software project. So you'll learn that right off the bat, right? And your mentor will be there to help, you know, help kind of teach you the norms of that community. So it's not like you're just jumping in and trying to figure it out yourself. You're gonna have someone there helping guide you and like giving you best practices. So that's kind of the cool part because that mentor really wants to see you succeed. So they're gonna help you as much as they can. And then also you're probably teach, you often can be teaching them something because you might ask a question and they're like, wow, I, 
I don't know, let's figure that out together, right? Or let's ask somebody else in the community. So, you know, you're really kind of, it, it's kind of a mutual relationship. Now you're obviously building a network of folks that you're gonna be able to, you know, hopefully you'll, we might work with in the future or just kind of building those contacts and distributed development. Obviously right now, most people are doing distributed development since a lot of folks are online. Um, you're gonna be working with people across the world. Time management, again, obviously a key to any job, but uh, here, because you are gonna be at your home or, or wherever you're gonna be working from, um, generally your home, your apartment, whatever, then you will be having to manage your time to make sure that you get your project completed in the allotted 10 weeks. Real world experience obviously is key. And then one thing that a few people mentioned last year, which I thought that was a really valid point, was the fact that you're gonna be working with large code bases because that's probably not something that you've done necessarily in your academic program yet. So being able to sit there and kind of go, oh, whoa, this is a massive code base and kind of understanding how, how it all works. And that really is a great way to help you learn those skills. So then when you go and get a job after you finish your studies, you can you know feel more confident in your abilities and be able to kind of walk right in and start some of these things that other people might have to you know learn on the fly. Now we have four main goals of the program. One is introducing students to open source software development. You know, the more people there are working on open source in the world, the better. Uh, that's what we think. And the other main one is helping these open source projects, bringing in new excited developers who again, hopefully will stay after the program ends and then giving students the real, uh, real world experience and also obviously just kind of having more code available for everyone to use. Um, we've actually had over 38 million lines of code produced during Google Summer Code in the previous 16 years. I think it's actually quite over that number, but it's kind of hard to really get an accurate number on that, but at least 38 million. So how does the kind of the flow of the program work? Well, right now we are in phase two. So. Uh, last month, we had open source projects that applied to be mentoring organizations for the program. I spent the last two weeks reviewing all of those applications from these mentoring organizations and narrowed it down to a certain number. Um, we will be announcing all of those accepted mentoring organizations next Tuesday on March 9th at, um, I think, 1800 UTC. Um, so I think uh, around 2 p.m. your time. and. Then at that point, students, so y'all, would want to go in, look at the accepted organizations. And it's actually pretty easy to do because we have a couple different ways that you can filter. You can filter by technology. So if you know Python, or you know Java, JavaScript, or you know um, C++, you can filter that way. So that'll narrow it down to a subset of those organizations. You can also kind of look at the type of organization. We have different categories like um, operating systems or programming languages or um, I think it was databases, cloud is one of them. So there's all kinds of different uh, categories. And then also we have one on our main organization page. Basically each organization has kind of a little box and they've given a seven to 10 word description of what their project does. So you can actually kind of scroll through those pretty quickly and you can kind of look for something that looks interesting to you. You just click on the box and then it'll open a whole page of information about that organization. So more details, it'll also link to that organization's project ideas. Now that project ideas list is really what you're gonna to wanna to look at because that's where you'll, where you'll figure out what project it, it is that you're gonna to want to write a proposal on to submit to the mentoring organization. So we're, I'm really glad we're talking this week because starting March 9th, starting on Tuesday, from March 9th to March 29th, so it's what, almost three weeks, students have that time to really investigate the organizations, maybe narrow it down to two or three that look interesting to you, and then we kind of research them a little more and look at their project ideas. And then you can go ahead and reach, we strongly encourage you to reach out to the organizations and ask them questions about the, those project ideas and really communicate with them. Because I can't get this across enough, communication is key to this program. 
the students who reach out to the organizations before the application period opens on March 29th almost always are um, much more likely to get accepted because the organizations want to know that you're asking questions and that you are really, you know, interested in that project and kind of being, you know, you ask them questions, they're going to give you some the answers and then you can kind of propose or adjust your proposal according to the way that they answer those questions, right? And also, on the other hand, you might think that this project looks interesting and then once you kind of start talking to the uh, mentors, you're like, well, maybe that's not what I want to do. Okay, let me try something else. Or on the other hand, you could go, this looks kind of interesting. Let me le learn a little bit more about it. And then you realize, oh no, this is super cool. This is something I really would like to work on. So, so that three week period is really key. So I would strongly encourage y'all, if you're really interested in taking part in this year's program, to spend between March 9th and March 29th reaching out to the organizations you can check out our student guide. Actually, you can do that even today if you want um, to learn more about the program as far as like little details about each phase of the program. There's even a section in our guide, our student guide on how to write a great proposal. So you want to check all those out. We'll have the links to that at the end of this talk. And also this whole slide deck um, I, I shared with Oshain and he can then share it on to all of y'all um, in PDF or PowerPoint form. So yeah, that way you'll have the whole slide deck if you want to look back at something later. Now, I mentioned um, March 29th. That is from March 29th to April 13th is when students are going to submit their written project proposals to the organizations. So what that means is you'll go into the site at that point and register yourself, you know, answer some basic questions, and then you'll submit your proposal officially through the GSOC website. And then after April 13th, the organizations will spend the next few weeks reviewing all the applications they've received from students. Then they're going to ask Google for a certain number of student slots. They're like, hey, we had, you know, 16 great proposals. Can we have 16 students? Um, Google may or may not give them that many. They may get five, but, you know, it all balances out. And then um, we will announce the students on, I believe it's May 17th, is when all the accepted students will be announced. And, and if, you're, if your proposal is not accepted, then you'll get an email saying it wasn't accepted as well. So May 17th is the next key date. And at that point, you'll, if you're accepted, you'll get an email saying that you've been accepted with this particular organization, and then this is the mentor assigned to you. You often might have a couple of mentors assigned to you. Now again, even though you might have two mentors assigned to you, you could have really the whole community that's going to kind of help you by answering your questions you know, on their community forums, whether that's a Slack channel or IRC channel or discourse or whatever. Um, so it really is about their whole community kind of helping you, but you will have one to two main mentors that are really focused on helping you set up your project goals and working with you on your deadlines and kind of the expectations of the project. So from May 17th until uh, June 6th, then that period is what we call a community bonding period. That's when you and your mentor really are going to figure out the milestones, the deadlines, and kind of really work on your project, uh, the, the prepping it, right? Getting ready to start coding. You won't necessarily start coding during that time unless you want to, um, but it's really about welcoming you into their community, you know, helping you understand which version control systems they're using, how they do reviews, also pointing you to maybe some documentation to help you understand more about their community and their the norms. And then from June 7th until uh, middle of August, mid to late August, that's the 10 week uh, time frame where you will be actually coding during the program. So um, I mentioned the evaluations. Uh, there are two evaluations. Because this year the programming period is 10 weeks, there are two evaluations. One after uh, the fifth week of the program, there's an evaluation, and then there's a second evaluation at the end of the 10 weeks. Now, you do have to pass that first evaluation after five weeks to be able to continue in the program. And if you do pass that evaluation at the midpoint, then you receive 45% of the stipend amount. And then at the end, you receive the final 55%. Now, I know people always get kind of concerned about, oh, well, you know, so people can fail out of the program. The answer is yes. But generally, if to fail, you really, I would say you, you should know that you're going to fail. And that the reason is 
most people who fail either just kind of disappear. You know, they just kind of like, they start coding and then they stop communicating with their mentor. They just kind of go away. Or, or sometimes the other problem is that they just really took on a much bigger project and kind of oversold their skill set. And so there's no way that they can do the, the actual tasks at hand, right? They wrote a great proposal, but they can't actually, you know, kind of execute on the stuff that they wrote. So those are the main reasons that people fail. Um, you know, because there is a lot of leeway in there. The mentors want you to succeed. So even if you're running behind on whatever your milestone is supposed to be at the fit, at the five week mark, even if you're running behind, the mentor is likely to still pass you as long as you two are communicating. Because as long as they've seen that you're putting in the effort and you're working towards, you know, towards your milestones and that you're actively, you know, committing code and asking questions, they're just going to most likely still pass you. So again, I, I try not to get people too concerned about that, the pass fail stuff. Generally, um, most years we had about 12% of people that, uh, that failed the program at some point. Now, and that also includes people who remove themselves because they, you know, suddenly something else came in, came up in their lives, whether they got sick or they just got another internship or, or something happened, right? So that number includes all of those people as well. And there usually are quite a, quite a few of those folks too. And then of course, at the end of the 10 weeks, you submit your code and then it's there available for everyone to be able to see and for the world to be able to use. Uh, eligibility, like I mentioned, you do have to be over 18 years old upon registration for the program. And the registration period is March 29th to April 13th. And then you have to be accepted into or enrolled in a post-secondary educational program by May 17th, which is the start, uh, the announcement date of uh, accepted students. Or we've also added this uh, to the eligibility this year. Uh, again, welcoming even more folks to be able to apply. If you graduated from a post-secondary program between December 1st and May 17th, 2021, you would also still be eligible to apply. So maybe, um, maybe you're going to graduate from your program next week, right? That's okay. You can still apply. Um, so, or maybe you graduated or know somebody who graduated a couple of months ago and you're like, wow, they really would probably be interested in this please do tell them about the program. You need to be eligible to work in the country in which you reside. Um, you can only, basically you can only be accepted in a total of two, a maximum of two Google Summer Codes. So if you've been accepted once before, that's fine. You can be accepted one more time. And then you can't be a resident of a US embargo country, which Jamaica clearly is not, so that's fine. And a couple of frequently asked questions. Obviously, we have a frequently asked questions doc on our website, but these top two kind of come up pretty often. So I wanted to discuss them here. The project this year, they are 175 hours. Now, we're allowing a lot of flexibility this year. So the 175 hours is over 10 weeks, but you and your mentor can decide, like maybe you decide, hey, just with what I've got going on this summer, I'd really like to just do the project in the first six weeks. That's fine, right? It still be a 175 hour project, but you would just do it over six weeks versus 10 weeks. Um, the other part of that is like, maybe you and your mentor want to add in a couple of like four or five day breaks somewhere in the, the mix to kind of give you a little bit of break. Or maybe you know you have to go to a wedding or, or maybe you have exams a particular week. So you want to take that week off from coding. So you just kind of, you know, move those hours heavy, you know, divide the hours differently. But that's totally up to you and your mentor to decide together, so that's fine. Um, we did try to add that flexibility to make it easier for folks this year. Now, the other question that comes up a lot is, you know, hey, I'm new to open source. Can I participate in GSOC? And yes, that's kind of one of the goals of the program. I mean, obviously, a lot of people do participate in GSOC who have been involved in open source, maybe in some way. Maybe they, Maybe it's just by contributing, you know, by, by doing a uh, pull request or something like that. Others might have helped on some small project. Some might have created their own open source project by this point, you know, it's kind of all across the board. Um, but a lot of people are completely new to open source. So yes, the idea is that we want to bring new folks into open source and to giving, giving you these mentors there to help guide you and welcome you to make it a much easier experience because it can be intimidating if you're just kind of a, a person wanting to go contribute to an open source project on your own 
outside of a problem or project or a program like GSOC, you're kind of, you know, you might be intimidated. You're like, well, why do they care what I, you know, what I think? Or why do they care, you know, if I do a pull request, why, you know, why would they accept it or merge it? You know, and which, you know, the whole thing with open source communities is they want new people coming in all the time. And GSOC is a great way for them to be able to do this. That's why we've had some projects, um, open source mentoring orgs, that have been a part of GSOC for all 17 years of the program. So we do have a, many of them come back year after year. Um, here's the timeline. Again, um, I kind of went over this, but uh, I will, again, uh, this can be shared, the whole slide deck can be shared with you. This is also available on our program. Uh, website at g.co slash gsoc as well. Now, a couple of things to remember. Um, this comes up quite a bit, and I could have added this to FAQ, I guess. But you do have to apply as an individual. This is not a team event. Now, you likely will be working with other folks in some capacity when you're doing your project, but it's not a team level. It's not a team type of uh, program. So you might be working with, maybe there are other students that are working on different projects with, say, the Apache Foundation or whatever. And maybe all, some of the stuff you all are doing might kind of connect. So maybe you're working together kind of in that way, or you're answering kind of, helping answer each other's questions as you go along. And that's totally fine. But it is an individual, an actual individual um, program. And one of the things we mentioned is that we, it is, it is kind of a prestigious program. Generally about 20% of the students that submit their proposals get accepted into the program. So if you submit a proposal and it's not accepted, don't be frustrated. Try again next year um, because it's just, you know, sometimes it's just they have five students with really good applications for one particular project and they just got, they can only accept one, right? So um, don't, don't get upset if you don't get, uh, don't get in the first time. Many people apply one year and then don't get in that year and they apply again the second another year one because they've got more experience a year later right but it's also maybe they just apply to another organization or or maybe they've written a better proposal or again they communicate because uh, communication as you can see in the final point here is very very important so just communicate with these organizations they want to hear from you and as i mentioned about expect about 17 to 18 hours a week on average during the 10 week program period. But again, you and your mentor may decide to make it 25 hours a week for a few weeks and then you have a week off here or another week you're like, hey, I can only do like five to 10 hours. And that's totally fine. Whatever you and your mentor decide together, that's that's cool with Google. So I added these in here um, because I was looking at some of the feedback from students in last year's program, the 2020 program. And 94% said that GSOC improved their programming skills. Another 94% uh, plan to continue with their mentoring organization after Google Summer of Code. And then 26% had never participated in open source in any way before GSOC. Um, I actually think that number is kind of low. I thought that number would actually be a little higher as far as, you know, more people not participating in open source. So this year, I kind of made the question a little more granular. Um, because I think people have participated in different ways. So I, I asked, a little, asked it a little bit differently in this year's um, application to see if we can kind of get that number. I mean, maybe it is 26%, but it, it seems like more people I talked to had never participated in open source before joining GSOC. So um, we'll keep playing with that and see what, uh, what falls out. Um, and then the following uh, three, the last three are really uh, just quotes from folks. So participating and contributing to an open source or an organization definitely gave me a strong sense of belonging and responsibility. And for the first time, I built purely functional code from scratch, used a lot of different cool open source software, 14 plus, and even tried my hand at front end development. This has been a tremendous learning experience for me. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, the perspective I have about technology now isn't just about how good the code is, now I care much more about how it helps the community. I'm more aware of the practical implications of technology. Now, these are some quick stats. I mentioned um, we had about 38 million, over 38 million lines of code produced in the program. And we've had over 16,000 students from 111 countries 
that have been accepted into GSOC that they have worked with 715 different open source organizations. Again, from tiny organizations to medium sized to really large organizations. So we kind of have something for everybody in there. Now, this is the, the slide that kind of has the useful information. Honestly, the top, uh, the program site, really everything you can get to from there, the rules, FAQs, the guide, all of that is available from uh, links on our main program site. And then if you have questions, so we'll open this up for questions here, um, but also if you think of something later, you can email us uh, at gsoc-support at google.com. All right, I'm gonna open it up for questions and I'll, I'll start stop presenting here so I can actually see some faces. There we go. Oops, maybe. There we go. Anyone has any question, you can um, unmute or raise your hand if you have any questions. All right, um, Patrick. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I wanted to ask, how do employers measure how much hours you spend on the project? Employers are mentors. Mentors, mentors. Mentors, okay. Um, they generally generally can kind of figure that out, right? Like it's pretty obvious if you're working an hour or two a week, or you're working ten to fifteen hours. I think so. Um, they're not having they're not having you write a um, like keep a timesheet per se. I mean, I guess a few boards might, but the majority don't. A lot of them actually require. They all kind of have their own requirements, but many of them require you to kind of submit something daily, or at least like Monday through Friday, right? Or have, have some kind of communication with them. And then there's usually at least a once a week or bi-weekly uh, meeting with the team or at least with your mentors. So they're kind of keeping in touch with you. And so they kind of see how your progress is going. So if you kind of have a meeting and then like the next week, you haven't really done anything, it's gonna be pretty obvious. Um, so yeah, that, that's how they, they, treat the, they kind of track it. All right, so add on to Stephanie's point, um, I'll give an example. So um, I was actually a student and a mentor, student in 2017, GSOC student and 2018 mentor. I right, during my students, um, 2017, what they tend to do with the organization that I was a part of, um, we do stand-up meetings or stand-up notes. If we can't do a meeting, I'll just post a stand-up note every other day to state what I did today, what I'm going to do for the next two days, or if I have any blockers. Because um, one of the key ingredients, as Stephanie pointed out, communication is very, very, very important. Because um, there, there are times when there are some simple tasks um that like as simple resources that um can literally change your perspective of how to do something so um they tend to prefer to you communicate as much as possible possible but give yourself enough time to code all right but when you come on to okay tracking your hours and so forth um most of the organization that i spoke to they they do it like it's like one of those mental um, type of thing people tend to figure out. So for example, in 2018, we had a student, I was mentoring a student, he, his proposal was extremely good. We saw his code, his code was clean, effective, very, very optimized, but his delivery was like um, taking a while um, during the coding period. So we are like, okay, something is going on. The student is more than capable to do the project and finish the task, but he is deliverable time is sluggish. So when we spoke to him, um, we found out that he was going through some family crisis and that um, slowed him down drastically. So um, at times your mentors might pick up, pick up on a certain stuff based on, of course, their the knowledge of your skill set and communication during the community bonding period. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Jordan from the Jamaican Developers Group. This video is a part of our meet and greet series. If you like what we are doing or this video, please like, subscribe and click the notification bell to not miss any further updates. 
If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave it below or contact us on our community forum at community.jamaicans.dev. See you soon. All right, so I'll go ahead and show the question. Um, of course, the level of uh, um, understanding as well as scoping of projects, Stephanie, um, is there any like sample projects you could like show where, for example, students contribute to open source um, so others can gauge like the, the level of activity or projects that they may work with? Um, so not really, um, we did make a kind of a change this year, right? Cause like previously the program had required students to spend about 350 hours programming in over 12 weeks. So okay. this is the first year that we've really changed it. So, um, obviously when I've been reviewing the organization applications and their project ideas, you know, we're making sure that they've adjusted them down to 175 hour projects versus you know a much larger project at 350 hours um but on march 9th so on tuesday you'll be able to see the actual project lists so then you'll kind of get an idea um a lot of these organizations as part of their application process require you to kind of do to do a pull request or to do a couple of things like that to kind of one to show that you have kind of at least some basic knowledge right um because occasionally some of the the projects do get essentially spammed, right? I mean, I hate using that word, but that is kind of what it is, right? You're like, you just have people who are applying, they're like, oh, this sounds cool, I can make money, okay. But they have to have no coding experience at all. Oh, and that's actually something that comes up, um, somebody might ask this, so I'll go ahead and address it. Um, but, you know, people say, well, how do I know if I'm, you know, I have, my skills are good enough to be a part of GSOC? Um, that's a good question. And a lot of people, a lot of the organizations have their projects labeled kind of either easy, medium, hard, or kind of small, medium, large, that type of thing. Um, because some of the projects are definitely just more complicated just because their code bases are more complicated. And some of them are really almost geared more towards people doing PhDs. But again, that's a small subset, right? Most of the organizations are looking for people who are beginning, you know, beginner coders, right? You still, you know, you need to know if you're doing a project in Python, you need to know how to code Python, but they don't expect you to be an expert, right? Like they don't expect. So they're, they know you're a student, they know you're learning. The key is that you're excited to learn more, right? Like if they show, if, even if you don't necessarily have all the skills right away, at least if you're willing to learn, then that excites them and that makes them happy because they like to act as teachers, right? They like to help you. So that's okay. So I would, I would keep that in mind, right? Um, you know, obviously if you just started coding two weeks ago, that's, and this is not the year for you to try, try next year. Um, but, uh, you know, if you've been doing like, um, if you're in your, even at the end of your first year or, or second year of like a two or four year program, definitely. Or if you're doing like a coding camp and it's, in, you know, intense, like four month type of program, if you're probably at least in the halfway part there, I would say you would be, you'd be fine. Maybe even earlier on, it depends, it depends. I know they learned, they really cram a lot of information in that short period of time. So, um, you might be fine if you're even the first month. Um, but really a lot of it is just how interested you are and in like how inquisitive you are and um, wanting to learn more, right? That's a key part. They just want you to be excited. They, they're excited about the work they're doing. They want to, you know, excite other students about it as well. Okay, um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, are there any questions? All right, um, you can go ahead uh, to it and unmute and ask a question. Um, good afternoon. Hey. Do mentor organizations have interviews or is a selection based only on the proposal? That's a good question. Um, so some have not an interview like you would normally think of for a, main, a big job interview. Like it might be a 10, meeting, 10 minute meeting. Um, your proposal does have to be submitted, right? And some of them that do require some sort of a, like I said, 10, maybe 15 minute meeting with maybe like the people they've kind of narrowed it down to because they really want to kind of get an idea. Like if you, especially if you haven't been already communicating with them um, before submitting the proposal, because a lot of folks will just submit a proposal. And what a lot of the orgs have found out is like, some people can write a wonderful, wonderful proposal, but that doesn't mean A, they can actually do the stuff that's written on there 
or B, that they actually really want to do that, right? Um, so I think that communication, whether it's even through chat channel or, or through like the interview, I guess it's essentially kind of an interview, but most of them don't do that. I think most of them really kind of rely on the communications via their chat channels and that type of stuff. And, and just kind of your, you might start having a conversation on the chat channel with one particular mentor and you know, you could have it over multiple days and then they know, hey, when they're talking about looking at all the students, they're like, oh, well, this student I talked to over you know, two or three different days and they really seemed interested. They were really interesting. They did this other type of project before or you know, they're interested because of this, and this is, you know, their background in this technology. Um, so having that kind of having that person go, oh, oh, so you already talked to this person. OK, so that's cool. That definitely gives you many uh, bonus points, I guess would be the right way to say that. Okay. All right. Thank you both for that question and uh, thank you for the answer, Stephanie. All right, um, to touch on that as well, um, what are some tips you normally like tell um, students when they come on to, okay, how can um, you make it easier for them to, you know, um, find an um, organization or find a project that, you know, they might be interested in and uh, tips on basically preparing themselves to for Google Summer of Code even before the application period. Yeah, I mean, I would say, like I said, as soon as the orgs are announced on on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, the ninth, go and look at that list. Um, and like I said, you could at least, at the very least, filter it by whatever technologies you know. So if you know Python, filter down to Python. So then you're like, okay, here's a subset of let's say there's 200 orgs. Okay, you know, four or let's say 70 of them use Python. Then you're like, okay, then I'm gonna look at these 70, right? Because there's no point in looking at a project that is doing C++ if you don't know C++, right? So uh, you can go ahead and cut your, your numbers down that way. And then you can also, again, look at, if you're like, hey, I really kind of am interested in astronomy. And you know, some of the organizations have these like proposal tags. So it could say astronomy, or it could be gaming, or it could be biomedical, right? Um, there's all kinds of different things like that. Um, it does require some work, right, to find the right org. But like I said, the other thing you can do is you can look at that page and really go quickly through the 200 plus orgs by looking at that seven word description. Now, good, some of them don't do really great descriptions of their org. Like you look at it and go, I still don't know what that means. Um, but at least it can kind of get you an idea. Oh, okay, that's a gaming one. I like gaming stuff, great. Or, oh, this is a, you know, uh, I don't know, this is a, a cloud thing. I'm really interested in cloud, right? So you can kind of figure it out that way. So. That's how I would say get you kind of the funnel down somewhat at least. Um, because there's obviously a lot of orgs that you're like, yeah, I don't care anything about that particular thing at all. And you don't even have to waste your time, just, just move on. Um, because that's the thing, when you're looking at somebody's project ideas list, also don't get freaked out because like I said, a few of these are very uh, niche organizations. And so some of the skills that they're gonna require not a lot of people are going to have, right? And so, again, it could be something that's more of a PhD level type of thing or very science oriented thing that a lot of people aren't going to have unless they happen to be in that field, right? So if you see that, be like, okay, don't get freaked out. They're like, oh, they're all going to be like this. They're not, right? There's only a very small number that are like that. So if that happens to be the first one you look at, don't, don't worry, just keep on looking. Okay. Thank you again. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, I'll go ahead and show in another one for me. All right. So um, during 2017, when I was doing GSOC, um, I was able to you know speak with the open source organization that I was um, basically working with um, and propose my own project. Um, to them, which is basically a complete rewrite of their team editor, which was something that no one touched for like 10 years. It was built in 2007. Then in 2017, I was the first person who actually contributed code to that portion of their software. Um, is that still something that is open where um, students can submit their own projects? I'm assuming they of course need to go towards the organization but um is the like from google side um is that still open where students yeah. can do so 
Yes, and um, some of the orgs don't necessarily want that, but most of them are open to that. Um, the problem is, I, I, I kind of don't even generally mention that in, meet, in uh, these kind of meetups, just because when you mention that, a lot of people will just propose some random thing that has nothing to do. They're like, this is something I want to work on. Well, that's wonderful, but it has absolutely nothing to do with this organization. Obviously, what you did was exactly the right thing, right? It's like, oh, this is based, like, hey, this organization needs a rewrite of this, and, you know, that's, that's right. But you'd be amazed at the kind of, again, spammy, I guess, type of proposals where people will submit, hey, I want to work on, I don't know, TensorFlow and someone random whatever, and then they'll submit that to like six different organizations and they're like, yeah, that's not even what we do. We don't care, right? Um, but yes, most organizations, usually at the bottom of their project ideas list will have, or, you know, you have a project idea to propose yourself, you know, please, you know, feel free to do that. Um, and the key to that is also, that especially is when you want to be talking to the organizations before you submit your proposal. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that you can only submit three proposals, up to three proposals. So if you're going to submit your own proposal as one of those, then make sure that you talk to the organization to make sure that they're remotely interested in what you're doing before you go and write a whole proposal and waste one of your three, you know, proposals on that, right? So because um, if they're like, oh, that sounds super cool then that, that definitely gives you kind of like, oh, okay, that's encouraging. You're like, okay, cool. Then I will go and write, you know, this lengthy proposal on um, this idea I have. Um, but yeah, no, some of the best or pro, um, projects have been proposed by students. So if the student already knows something kind of about that organization or even that kind of that technology, um, they're like, oh, well, this might be kind of cool. So, because again, sometimes the orgs don't know that they need this thing until somebody kind of says, well, what about if I could do this? So yeah, that's definitely an option um, to keep in mind for anybody that might have some inkling of something they'd really like to do, especially if it's for, again, some organization like TensorFlow or whatever organization or Python Software Foundation, et cetera. Um, to touch on the no um, notion, um, one of the thing you can do uh, also, based on the list of organization that will be listed on um, GStock website, you can actually find their community forum and basically um, just start with the community building from there. And if you have an idea, you just basically um, po propose it there. So that would be like the organization would give it a thumbs up before you actually go ahead and write a proposal. So that's basically the route that I took before I actually include it in my proposal. Find out if they are, um, the org is interested uh, um, via their community forum. Um, and another notion is um, when you come on to being familiar with their technology, um, I do recommend like, like for example, um, mobile developers or website developers. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if WordPress or Footer or these organizations on the, the list of organization, but also look at like the tech stuff that you tend to be interested in, right? you know, like what um, Stephanie proposed. And then just find an organization on the GSOC um, website. Hold on. Um, that basically matches some form of platform or tech stack. So if hopefully Flutter is a part of that um, with of organization and you, you've you been you know, doubling in uh, um, probably Google Maps or Flutter or something, that's something you probably could uh, um, look into if it's listed on the um, with our projects or again, just find out from the community, do an early community bonding. And uh, well, what gave me in 2017, what also gave me an edge to get into GSOC, I started to contribute to the open source before I applied. So they saw, oh, this there's some new random student just making change to the code even if it's just um documentation small css bug fix it basically helps you to you know understanding their code base understanding their um guidelines when you come on to contribution to their code and so forth and that will give um one um these mentors uh, like an idea that oh 
you're interested, you took initiative, and you look like a very promising students, student. So that's something that I would recommend that you probably start to do um, either before the application just to get familiar or after up to the community bonding and coding um, period of GSOC. Um, are there any more questions? Yes, that's a, that's a no. All right. Um, let me can let me see if I can drive uh, uh generate another okay. question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there was a question in the Q and A, but I'm not seeing it on my screen anymore. Um, someone is asking about your experience, given that it's there's always been an online element to the program. Um, my experience. Well, I, I mean, all right. So I have a bit of backstory when come on to um, remote work. So I've never had a nine to five. I've always like since I started. Okay, I started programming in two thousand eleven when I entered UWE. So UWE was the first time I actually, you know, um, six months after I landed a job because. I, I'm the type of person, once I see something that I like, my brain just start to click, my fingers just start to do, and I dive into it. Um, so from the, like 2011 to 2017, I was strictly remote, working remotely as a student, um, learning re remotely as a student, because I, I, the funny thing is that I'm the type that always at school but never at school um maybe some people can you know um reminisce with that um so for me when i was when i entered gsoc it was like any other remote job um communicate online with my mentors using discourse and i'm lucky if i can tell she works with me i'm always up for communication knowledge sharing and so forth um uh, code base um the first one of the first thing i learned um during my university or in university is web technology and git I knew that once I got into Git web technology, it would have opened a lot of doors for me. Um, so it was an easy transition doing GSOC. But if you're new um, to like remote work or um, like like any internship or so forth, um, I would recommend that ensure that you you are very comfortable with uh, just being transparent being an effective um, communicator, um, just writing um, other news, know about where you are, um, what you want to do, um, if you have any blockers, because like I said, um, a part because the student that I was mentoring in 2018, I wrote the code for what he was working on. The other two mentors um, didn't write the code, so I was missing for like one week and then when they when i came back they asked me um oh he was he couldn't do this and i'm like oh here's the exact line that he needs to change and it was just um it just like three characters he had to change to complete that task so as it again um just ensure that you know you always communicate um availability is really good as well and the mentors even as a student just try to be as available um as much as possible um because at the end of the day these mentors want to work with you to ensure that you pass and uh, i mean you as a student you're getting knowledge from like very experienced individuals so be upfront be available to uh, um, accept knowledge, communicate effectively, and just work with the, the team that you're given. And uh, even as mentioned, um, Stephanie, 
um, don't be be afraid to just put it on your community forum because your mentors are one set of people that are there for you, but you have that entire community to just ask a question and they'll just give you a response. So my experience was very welcoming. Even for example, it was so welcoming that whereby after I completed the project, I went, they actually told me to come to Barcelona. So I got flown to Barcelona and the following year I went to Japan because of that community. Um, when I went to Barcelona, the guy who created that um, that um, function that, well, that feature that I worked on, he met me and was like, um, I have seen all you and we were talking. And then I, I, I uh, told it, said oh yeah i'm the student that work on um the feature that elk steel created and he's like elk steel oh cool cool oh by the way i'm elk steel so they 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 are very excited for you to um contribute to their open source so they it will always be like a welcoming um type of feeling um that you might get there, of course, one and two times, if you don't perform, then uh, it will be welcoming. They'll try, and, try to work with you, but at the end of the day, um, if you're performing bad, um, it, it, they can just help you as much as they can, can because they are not supposed to code for you. So it's it's very it was very easy, very welcoming, and very like a lot of knowledge transfer happening. I hope that answered your question somewhat. Um, is there another question, Latifa? I'm not seeing any. Okay, nothing. Um, any other questions? Um, I have a question for you. So, in your experience as a student in the GSOC um, program, could you compare it to, like, say, a nine-to-five job, or was it something more, uh, what's the term for it now, freer? Well, as mentioned before, I've never worked on nine-to-five. I see nine-to-five as uh, something that will dampen one's creativity, uh, freedom of expression, especially when come on to coding. Um, there are more effective ways to spend your time during the day. Um, so when you come on to um, freedom, I, the funny thing about Google Summer of Code or any remote work is that it not just only introduce you to the technology, it introduced to personal growth, project management, time management. So you basically work on your own time, but as long as you deliver um, on time, if you don't deliver on time, make sure you communicate effectively that, oh, um, there's going to be like a slight delay here and there. Um, you, you were having a uh, blocker and so forth so like um it's freer but it all depends on you if for example if you start early and you probably have a task that do takes two hours or so um you assume that it takes two hours and you wait last minute or uh, the last day to start you might come up on problems that you didn't foresee and that might take a two hour into eight hour especially the f fact that um you didn't you weren't upfront with the community to state that okay um you're going to start working on this day and then you feel in the position that okay um because you kind of started late uh, the community got the impression that you actually started early um you may not feel like to communicate that um you're working on it now when it was supposed to start work on two weeks ago so um it all depends on you if you start early um you know get the help uh, get advice and guide and so forth finish the component or uh, milestone early you have a lot of time to you know maneuver 
um, for me, when I was doing GSOC as a student, I was doing final year project at UA. I was working full time at a company, doing GSOC, traveling, and um, I was actually doing some sporting event while still hosting event and participating in a startup program. So seven large um, activities I was doing at the same time. Um, and all of them, yeah, I accomplished because I properly managed um, how I'm going to uh, um, allocate my time and what I'm going to work with. Everyone had a slot to where I communicate effectively with them or and just maneuver basically my daily tasks. So it at, at the end of the day, as I said, it's basically you being like in charge of your own time or you manage your project or you manage yourself um going forward and honestly not just from the tech stack it's really a good experience to have um to help you with career development and you know focus and so forth um i'm not sh well stephanie i guess you can add more you know uh, meat to that um sorry i got distracted by another email i apologize uh which part of that uh <laughs> um the the question about the oh is it like versus a nine to five the freedom and flexibility uh, yeah i mean that that's what i do in my daily life right like i mean i don't do nine to five um like you know i get up do a few hours of work go outside enjoy the nice sunny weather and then uh come back and work my day so um that's kind of one of the nice things about uh, GSOC or any other type of remote work like that. Because also with GSOC, it's very likely your mentor is going to be in another time zone. Like, could be a really different time zone, right? They could be in Singapore or they could be in Russia or Poland, right? Um, so we're not talking about just, you know, California versus Jamaica, right? It, it, it can be very significant. So, um, you know, that's also why sometimes you have multiple mentors because maybe some of them are closer to a more reasonable time zone or maybe your morning is somebody else's early evening and that's okay versus the the singapore one and new zealand one those are a little tricky sometimes um but yeah i mean it's the remote thing like I, i'm one of the few people i think that's like enjoyed working from home this whole time um because uh i used to travel a lot so i was working from wherever i was anyway Right. And so it's something that I like. I just I miss having the interactions with people in person. That, that That's my big part. Right. Um, I like the balance of doing both before. Now it's you, you only have a you know computer screens. But I mean, the flexibility is great because also I think where the world is going anyway, even post pandemic. Right. It's like more and more companies realize, wait, we don't have to have people sitting in a building anymore. Um, I mean, I think companies like was it Facebook and some of the others have said, yeah, or Twitter have said, yeah, we're going to just go all remote. Right. Um, so I think that is definitely something a lot of companies are going to look into because if you know you don't have to have expensive buildings for all of your staff all the time, why do it? Um, so I think learning how to work remotely and balancing, figuring out what that time um, requirement is uh, for you, and just kind of adjusting yourself is really important. And so that's something that's another nice learning, uh, I guess, from the GSOC program. And then this year, because it is a smaller time commitment it's probably a little easier versus like when, when you did it, Oshan, it was, um, you know, 30 hours a week, right. That yeah. you were to do. Right. So that, that's, you know, like that's almost full time. Right. And so that's a lot, that's harder, right. Versus 70 to 18 hours. You're like, okay, I can do three hours a day, six days a week, or I can do, you know, five, that five hours, three days. And then, you know, so and it really is kind of what you and your mentor decide. Your mentor may want you to do something every day for five days straight. Like it, it kind of depends on what you, the two of you agree on and kind of come to a agreement with. I mean, ultimately they kind of get to make the final decision on that, but you definitely, they want your input, right? They don't want you to be miserable where you're like, they're like, okay, every morning at 7 a.m. I've got to do this. Like, that's not cool. They're not going to ask you to do that, right? Um, Cause that's painful for anybody, I think. <laughs> yep. So yeah, it's all about flexibility. It's just about, and they do that. They're used to that too, right? In their own jobs. They, they all, a lot of these people have, they're doing other things. Again, they're volunteering to do this. Um, so they want to make their time, you know, helping you worth it, right? Because they're spending anywhere from, depends, three to six or seven hours a week, depending on what the project is, especially depending on if it's something they're really interested in too. 
Um, you know, so they don't want to waste your time. They don't want you to be waste. You know, they don't want to waste their time. So it's it, it's all about efficiency, but um, flexibility is key. And I and I think that's one of the things that the program has. Um, has helped the program for all of these years. And, and, and now it's just kind of, that's why last year was so easy for us because we didn't have to change anything about the program because we were already doing this. Everybody else had to make all these big adjustments and, you know, because of the pandemic. And we were like, we just added an extra week to let people submit, to have longer to submit things. That's all we did. We changed the time by, by one week and everything else literally stayed the same. So, um, which is kind of cool. And it's like, oh wow, we were built for pandemic. Who knew? Uh, we didn't know we, we did that. But yeah. Yeah, just to add to it as well, is that the tech industry has been around flexibility from way back, long before COVID. And we had to work with people overseas, India, Eastern Europe. So it's always been there that, you know, it's not a nine to five job. You know, you work, it's a creative job actually. So whenever you're creative, you get a midnight and you come up with an idea to fix a problem, you go do it, you know? So <laughs> you have to be like that. And self-management is critical. Look at it in terms of managing your time as a person and what you're outputting. I think people will measure you based on what you're putting out. Uh, I think that's the key thing, not so much about when you actually work. So just to add to that. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, um, that's a no. All right, so I can't think of any more questions to generate um, at this moment. Um, so I guess with that, um, Stephanie, if you have any like last ad minute advice or uh, thoughts or comments, um, you can you know share and then we probably wrap, wrap up afterwards. Sure, I would just say, um, to reiterate for anybody that might have come in later, the key is to really look at March, starting next week, look at all those organizations and then just start figuring out which ones interest you and reach out early. The earlier you reach out and communicate with these organizations, the better off your chances are. And also it's better for you just to, because they're going to have more time over the next three weeks. Once the student applications open on March 29th, they're going to be swamped. So if you have some questions between now or between March 9th and March 29th, they're going to have a lot more time to get back to you and give you quality feedback versus if you wait to March 29th to submit, you know, to start asking questions, they may not be able to answer your questions. They may just be too over, overwhelmed that they're, you know, it may take them six days to answer you or, or they just kind of have to kind of go, well, we can only answer so many of these. And so that's the key, right? Talk, talk to them early. Um, it's best for you. It's going to make it easier for you. You're going to get a better response from them. Um, and then also read the student guide. I highly recommend it. I know people don't like you know, like guide. You're like, oh, eh. uh, we used to call it manual. And that was like worse words. So we're like, we call it a guide now. But it, it, each chapter is like one page. So it's not like this gr crazy big thing, right? It just, like I said, there's a section on defining um, or uh, writing a good proposal. So definitely check that out. And it's also kind of like, I think there's even a section on, am I good enough, right? There's literally, and some of these are just like four paragraphs. So there, it's very short, but it just will help you understand. And it was written by mentors, former students, uh, program administrators like myself and um, organization administrators. So we wrote it, it was originally written, I think almost 10 years ago. And then we tweaked it over the years as things have changed, but it's it stood the ground. Like literally everything that's in there, very few things that I had to change over the last 10 years um it, it stands so i would say at least read that and of course um you know maybe the faqs and the rules or whatever but at least read the guide to really make you understand more about the program so. yeah all right thank you very much stephanie um mark mark and do you want to add to anything stephanie um said i think not much really i mean <laughs> <laughs> she covered it all she covered it all okay. <laughs> what I challenge people to do is go and challenge themselves, you know, don't be intimidated by the program. I think they should take the plunge and, you know, do the research and, you know, apply. We love to see a lot of people from Jamaica there and we'll try to get as much mentors, you know, as possible. Support okay. them. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Akron. All right. Yeah. Um, from um, our side, the community, of course, um, all of the information um, Stephanie provided, um, we'll publish it on our forum um, at community.jamaican.org.
dev that dev um apart from that um this recording um we're going to publish it on our um website as well as our youtube page and if there's anything um you have question about of course yes there's a gsoc website but we are also open to you know um talk about some of like the approaches that you can take and of course we will help you to guide you to which um like organization that probably best fit you just in case like you might have a tech stock in mind but don't necessarily know what to do um and where to go um you can just reach out to us and we will basically guide you to either gsoc documentation or provide some form of help otherwise so with that said everyone thank you for attending i hope all of this was very insightful and looking forward to see at least 10 to 20 applicants from jamaica so take care all the best and i guess i could say happy new year even though it's march um right thank um, everybody and, and thanks again once more um stephanie and Larkin for attending and participating well thank you all for attending i didn't expect there to be six seven four yeah. <laughs> That was great. I was like, I was very excited about that. That's awesome. Hey, we've reached the end of this video and I just have to say thank you so much for watching. I know these videos can get pretty long, but I do hope it was informative, fun, and insightful. If you like this video, don't forget to click subscribe and hit the notifications bell in the description below. Once again, thank you for watching. See you in the next video and blessings from the Jamaican Developers team.